we'll start by talking about the arguable limits of scientific inquiry. Can science eventually know everything? This is the big question that Gardner asks and answers with a no. Though he's not anti-science, he's not picking on science. Science is, for Gardner, the best systematic approach we have to reality. If we really want to understand reality, we should be doing something like science at some point. And his point is just that even that best approach we have to knowledge will be inexhaustible that whatever apparently final answer you come to is in principle subject to further questions. That every axiom in your system involves assumptions which can be further queried. So that's, I mean, that's Gardner's position in a nutshell. He distinguishes between two senses of everything, just, just to be clear. There's this trivial sense of knowing every true proposition, like, for example, how many hairs on his head Jesus had. Well, you can know Christianity without knowing the answer to that question. In this case, we'd say you should, you should know the content of the Sermon on the Mount, the, the, the sermon that Jesus gave and its message. But there are the trivial facts of the situation uh, don't need to be known. And similarly in science, we don't expect that you have gone out and weighed every single hydrogen atom, past, present, and future in the universe to know hydrogen atoms. Uh, what we expect is that you've discerned through your chemical investigation the underlying structure of reality. You've discerned the deep principles according to which physical reality operates. So the, the, the more profound sense of everything, Gardner says, if we focus it scientifically, is all the fundamental laws of physics. So this is what science seeks in its quest to know everything. It's a quest for maybe a grand unified theory of everything, a single pithy equation we can print and put on t-shirts and bumper stickers. But this is the sense of everything that um, science ambitiously seeks to cover. And, and Gardner, again, says that will never be done this. There are practical limits on inquiry. First of all, we're not smart enough. If you Google list of unsolved problems in physics, uh, you'll get a really interesting list of questions. These are questions at the cutting edge of physics, uh, which we don't have an answer to yet, but which people are contemplating or working on. Some of these, presumably, uh, will we'll at some point find an answer to. Some of these may be deeper, weirder questions, which we don't even quite know how to frame. We're really plunging into mysteries that may at some point exceed our ability to solve. There, there may always be as long as we're around an article in Wikipedia called List of Unsolved Problems in Physics. And some of those items in that list might be there because we homo sapiens just aren't smart enough to solve them. And some alien species with an IQ of 20,000 has cracked them. So that would be a practical limit. Practical limits on the acquisition of knowledge have to do with limitations in, in the uh, seeker, I think, or its, its situation. If <clears throat> the universe has bottomless levels, that would be a very deep practical limit on our ability to crack reality. We'd, whatever level we get to, um, there's always a deeper level 
to dig down to beyond that. And that could be because there's always a bigger tortoise and the universe has endless levels. This is an idea that Asimov liked at least. And again, that, that would be sort of, I, the word practical is not quite uh, right here, but this is just a deep fact about our particular universe, perhaps. And in our universe, unfortunately, uh, we can't figure it all out because our universe is infinite, but there are possible universes which are finite and are which which are um completely comprehensible perhaps so practical limits could have to do have to do with let's say contingent limits either facts about the perceiver or facts about their particular world um, um, that prevent the completion of knowledge intrinsic limits and these are the focus of gardner's article um, his point is that there are actually intrinsic limits on the acquisition of knowledge these are not particular to science and these are not particular to um, human inquirers or our universe these are built into the very nature of knowledge of, of explanation So Gardner mentions Gödel's famous incompleteness theorems. Um, Every mathematical system complex enough to include arithmetic contains theorems that cannot be proved true or false within the system. Um, and the system cannot demonstrate its own consistency. Now you can construct a meta system around the first system, which can point to the first system and prove that first system's consistency but then that meta system can now be considered as a system and Gödel's um, skeptical conclusion would apply to it too we can we can ask is that second larger system consistent and to answer that we can construct a third system around the first and second and point to the second system to prove the second system's consistency but then we can so you can add infinitum or to infinity with without cease uh, there will be a unsolved question of the system's consistency according to Gödel this is an idea um, many people may have had before Gödel Gödel I, I take it proved it with with some mathematical rigor similar and around the same time Tarski's undefinability theorem arithmetical truth cannot be defined in arithmetic this is a to my mind a more philosophical <laughs> uh, version of of Gödel's second point there's you're assuming a notion of truth as you as you do arithmetic a certain definition of what what counts as true and we can ask in in the philosophical mode as as we put down the pen and 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 take you know step back from the page of math well what what does truth mean that's we're now doing philosophy that's like the second system we build around the first system to demonstrate the first system system's consistency we're now asking a kind of meta mathematical question and to answer that i guess we're presuming some kind of philosophical notion of truth and then we can ask a meta philosophical question and so we get like like in Gödel a, a regress problem here where whatever stage of, an, of of contemplation you're at we can always ask a question about 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 that about that system Gardner puts this point I think it's this the same point as any theory any explanation involves axioms or brute facts these are the givens of the system these are the first principles of the system this is the first cause you you draw the whole causal order back to and point to as the originator of the whole system 
And we can then ask, well, what explains it, right? And these, this is an intrinsic limit, meaning it's hard to imagine how explanation of any kind could get outside of this problem. Why does the Earth go around the sun? Because it obeys the laws of gravity. Why are there laws of gravity? Because Einstein revealed large masses distort space-time, causing objects to move along geodesic paths. Why do objects take geodesic paths? This is, you know, this is Jimmy in the back seat bugging mom with a series of questions, and Jimmy's quite persistent. And mom knows an awful lot about modern physics, but even mom comes to Mom with the PhD comes to a stopping point. Little Jimmy asks the excellent question, why do objects take the shortest paths? And uh, mom is stumped there, or at some point mom will be stumped. At some point mom just has to say, as, as one famous atheist said at a public lecture I was at once in response to a similar line of Q&A, it's just as God made it. <laughs> It's just, it's just the way it is, and that's all we know. Um, now, when we get into what's called biocosm theory, I think we'll have the inkling of a, at least a potential answer to this kind of question. Why do objects take the shortest paths? Well, those are the most efficient paths. Why is nature an efficiently organized system? Well, that might be the mark of adaptation, that just as the animal processes and consumes energy efficiently because inefficient processes were deselected in natural history, maybe in the grand soup, not supernatural, but grand natural history of universes, the inefficiently functioning universes are deselected for using up too much uh, multiverse energy. Uh, so there, there, Gardner's point is not that we'll come to a question which has no answer in principle. His point is that uh, here, at least, we, um, whatever point of questioning we're at, there's, there's a further question, often a very subtle question we can ask. So formally, the process of explanation looks like this. Um, P1 holds, or P1 is true. P1 is proposition one. Um, the Earth goes around the sun. The Earth goes around the sun, proposition one. Well, why is P1 true? Well, it obeys the laws of gravity. Right? P1 is true because of P2. And whatever P2 is, Garner's point is, again, formally, you can really see it. Whatever P2 is, we can formulate a question of the form. Why does P2 hold? ad infinitum. What will stop this? What is it in the nature of P5 that would disallow this question? So this is an endless regress. We'll, we'll see several examples of endless regresses. This is an endless regress of explanation. And there, therefore, explanation is never, never done. Gardner uses as an example, as just a candidate theory of everything, superstring theory, which is the view that the multitude of fundamental particles are in fact differing vibrations of one dimensional strings. So there's a deep unifying of even, even the small set of fundamental, fundamental particles that the standard model discloses, the unifying of them into this one type of thing, a string, and you get variety in reality from the different oscillations and I think different different forms of these strings. So the strings can uh, curl or loop or they can remain unbound and depending on whether they're looping or not and depending on their oscillation rates I suppose uh, you get the different sort of zooming out. I don't want to call it the macro level but zooming out a little bit from that you get what look to us like electrons and quarks and reality builds up from from there this is the dream of physical 
reductionism to break the complex down, to analyze it into its component parts. And so one, one version of the grand dream of physics is to reduce all of physical reality into some hopefully simple type of thing. You can see how in its outline, superstring theory gives us, it seems, that reductionist dream. It may have problems of its own, which make it currently far from a consensus view among, among physicists, but, but part of the excitement about superstring theory is that it seems to meet the, the, the dream of, of physical reduction, which is, we had inklings of in the table of elements, the 118, which by the 1970s further reduced to 16, 17 now with the Higgs boson, uh, types of particles. <clears throat> so we see the, the crunching of complicated reality. If you look at look at the room around you, there are many, many different types of things in the room. There's your mouse and there's your cup and there's your the latch on your window and uh, there's every um, every fiber in the carpet you're standing on, de depending on how you divide up your room, there are millions or even trillions of different things in it. But reduction, reductionism says if you zoom in, you can see that really there are just 16 or 17 things around you in different combinations. Even if quantum mechanics becomes explained as part of a deeper theory, call it X, string theory was one example, as Einstein believed quantum mechanics eventually would be, then we can ask, why X? There's always a further question that can be asked. There's no escape from the super ultimate questions. Why is there something rather than nothing? And why is that something structured the way it is? I guess these would be pretty close to the final conceivable questions. Why is there something rather than nothing? A little more specific than that is, why is that something structured the way it is? This is this is the level physics operates at. It's not clear physics is equipped to answer this question. It's not clear that anything is. We, that's why he calls it ultimate. Or I'm not sure what super ultimate means exactly, but ultimate means final. And it's hard to imagine a question more final than this. May, maybe, maybe that... <clears throat> um, tower of P's, P1, P2, P3, P4, P5, really does end, end here with this question, but it's a question to which there's no, no, no conceivable answer. Gardner mentions this really great metaphor of the growth of knowledge. Think of it as a expanding sphere. What we know is a sphere. And as we learn more, that sphere expands. It moves out into the surrounding darkness of ignorance. Notice that as the size of the sphere increases, the surface of its area increases. And so as we learn more, our contact with the unknown increases. Maybe more specifically, that means that the more we know, the more questions we have, the more questions we're capable of asking. An interesting way of thinking about the results of scientific inquiry. We tend to think of the result of scientific inquiry to be deep facts about, about nature, knowledge. But Newton, in, in his work the optics where he set out to as he says not just explain the properties of light by hypotheses but to propose and prove them by reason and experiments newton ends the optics with a uh, third book of queries a series of questions which he can now ask after figuring out quite a bit about the nature of light with just a prism and a pencil and a, a window with sunlight streaming through it, he figures out an awful lot about the nature of light. 
and then is in the position at the end of that inquiry to ask excellent questions. These questions, many of which, which perhaps weren't possible before the investigation. So the, what, what was the deep outcome of Newton's inquiries? Well, it was partly the, what he stated, he had set out to propose, but it was also maybe the, the questions, which of course create further projects for subsequent generations of scientists. And hopefully we get answers to those questions too. But, but if this is an unending process as, as Gardner proposes, then you might start to think about the questions being just as much the fruit of the inquiry and the almost the end point of it as as the answers. This is how Socrates thought about heaven. Well, not heaven, but when Socrates was imagining the afterlife and claimed at his at his trial that he wasn't concerned about being executed because, well, if there if if there was an afterlife, he'd just get to continue his philosophical inquiry there. <laughs> so Socrates's life was was characterized by questioning and it seemed to be what he enjoyed most and he imagined continuing to do that for eternity. So there's a nice, it's not a reconciliation of science and religion at the end of Gardner's piece and, and he doesn't, I don't think his view is that Religion and science can operate as a tag team duo. And when, when science has reached its limits, it can slap religion on the hand and religion can come into the ring and pick up where, where science failed. It's, it's that science and religion at their best are characterized not by an arrogant sense of certainty, but rather awe before a mystery that contact with reality yields to the scientists at, at, at the cutting edge mystery which is not apparent to the masses the science trickles down to in in you know high school science and ted talks and so on i mean m most of us receive the trickle down science and for most of us the we, we get a distorted picture of what science is then we we think of it as as something which gives us certainty about the world but those looking out into the darkness at at, at the avant-garde um, see the mystery and they and they have respect or awe for it that emotion of awe is really what unites religion and science at their best again in religion there's what rudolf otto famously called the mysterium behind all the <clears throat> modulations of the divine personalities of dress and form there's there's in our mystical reports uh awe before this this mystery this is something we are repelled from we fear but we're almost like moths to a flame attracted to this is uh, one of the famous descriptions of an encounter with the mysterium in the bhagavad gita there arjuna has asked his friend krishna to reveal his true form to him. Arjuna knows that uh, Krishna is actually the incarnation of Vishnu, the God. And Arjuna pleads for just a, just a glimpse of the divine nature and Krishna gives it to him. And here's a 20th century artist's pretty magnificent rendering of the God and it's full terrifying and benevolent aspects. And Arjuna famously has to tell Krishna to turn it off. It's too much. And Arjuna's system can't step down or transform the power into the human. And uh, this is this, this it's, it's so when those who see God, like Arjuna, those who see God directly come away from that encounter humbled and understand that uh, God is something you you don't understand that <laughs> that's almost i think Otto made it close to the core of the definition at least of the experience of god that it's experience of something that exceeds us so again the one who comes down from the mountain understands that god is a mystery those who receive the ten commandments and the trickle down revelation the indirect revelation uh, become arrogant and 
confident that they know what God is. Ask the, ask the average Christian or Muslim to define God, and they'll, they'll very confidently give you a description of what God is. And they'll speak with the confidence of their tradition, which they, they take to have solved <laughs> the problem of God, and speak to Moses or maybe Muhammad, I, I, I don't know, and you'll maybe get a different sense of what, what God is. If you take philosophy of religion with me, we'll we'll talk about Roland Puchetti's problem of how how would G let's not call it God, how would G even know that it knows everything? Um, you can take this to be an application of Gardner's problem to God's own psychology. Remember, if Gardner is really pointing out a in principle limit. To knowledge, then God uh, may be subject to it also. Uh, so uh, we didn't we didn't take it that far, but uh, one can wonder how, what is it about God's form of knowing that gets gets over this regress problem that Gardner um, elucidates problem of unknown unknowns. How does God know that there are no unknown unknowns? God knows what God knows. And God maybe presumes that all that there is, is included in God's awareness. But um, but we could ask God, it might be the first question Socrates asks God, entering the pearly gates. How do you know, God, that there are no unknown unknowns to you? Well, there may be answers to Pachetti's problem, but that's for another course. And uh, sort of a sequel, part partly a sequel to this course is PHL 923. That's called Philosophy of Religion Part 2. And uh, one reading we'll, we'll cover there is Carl Jung's analysis of the book of Job, an essay he wrote called the Answer to Job. And Jung's very stunning hypothesis in, in his essay is that in the human Job's encounter with Yahweh, Yahweh, to his horror, realizes that the creature knows something that the creator doesn't. And Jung, sort of putting Yahweh on the psychoanalytic couch, uh, diagnoses his anger and his rage, his inappropriate rage at this poor groveling worm um, whom Yahweh can crush with a glance. It's Yahweh's inappropriate, unbalanced anger at Job is diagnosed by Jung as a reaction to a partly suppressed awareness by Yahweh that the creature knows suffering, the creature knows finitude. The creature, by being small, knows things that the big one can't possibly know. And <laughs> an even more stunning corollary to this hypothesis is that the incarnation some centuries of earth time later of Yahweh into Yeshua of Nazareth is Yahweh's response to this and similar encounters with Job that in encountering the creature, Yahweh realizes that there are things the creature knows that I don't and hand it to Yahweh for being ambitious and having inexhaustible appetite for knowledge. Yahweh decides to give up his own divine nature, at least temporarily in order to acquire creaturely knowledge. Let's talk now about the origins of science. Well, it's a, it's a parlor game, let's say a, <clears throat> a, a party game uh, to, to 
ask who was the first X, who was the first scientist, who was the first philosopher, who was the first uh, novelist, and, and so on. And, uh, you know, before we propose some, some answers, it's worth noting that that it is a bit of a, a game. It's a semantic game in part. Hopefully one we can, we can in the process of playing, uh, <clears throat> get, gain some understanding of the phenomenon in question. It becomes, as I said, a, partly a semantic game about what it is we mean by scientists. Well, any, any plausible definition of scientist should, let's say, include this quintessential modern scientist, Newton, who, who I don't think would be anyone's pick of the first scientist, though he, he, he gave us one of our first very uh, dramatic, uh, very accurate, general um, systems which, which, which can describe physical universe. So something approaching an accurate reductionist physical theory. But Newton's epoch making work in physics actually has philosophy in the title and physics or science nowhere to be seen. This is the um, Philosophiae Naturalis Principia Mathematica, or uh, Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy, I think if you ask Newton, so wh what do you do for a living? Um, he would have said, I'm a natural philosopher. Philosophy is the love of wisdom. The practice of philosophy is the somewhat, somewhat rigorous, systematic pursuit of knowledge, and then all of the uh, avenues of, of, of knowledge work are disciplines or sub-disciplines of philosophy. If, if you're interested specifically, it's not very specific, but if you're interested in knowledge about nature, then you're a natural philosopher, meaning you, you focus on uh, knowledge about the natural world. So the term the term scientist is actually relatively new. It's a word we can trace back to its first usage in a letter the Englishman William Hewell wrote in 1833. I, the word science was around before that, long before that, and goes back to uh, the Latin. But scientist as the occupation title for one who, who pursues science is a new term. So again, we're, we're playing a bit of a parlor game, uh, clearly indicated by the fact that the, the term in question is very new and uh, there's a sense in which anyone named prior to 18, well, this isn't quite right. I was gonna say anyone, any candidate who, who, who lived prior to 1833 would be somewhat of an anachronistic pick, but uh, that's not strictly or necessarily true. Anyway, um, <clears throat> let's play the game. So here's, let's go way back. This I don't think would be a, a popular choice for the first scientist, but uh, a lot of people would urge us to go back to the Greeks and to look at what happened in ancient Greece around 2,500 years ago. Though with Hesiod, you can see we're probably dipping back quite a bit before that even. This is 2700 to 2650 years ago. And when we when we dip back into Hesiod, I think we're getting to that um, point where the historical record merges a bit into, into myth. I don't think we know very much about Hesiod, the man, but here we find depicted what we've been told about him, that Hesiod, here he is right here, was visited by uh, the muse. Uh, he was struck with inspiration 
and was was given an answer to his question. The, the muse appears and sort of genie-like says, here I am. Tell me what you want to know. Ask me a good question. And maybe the muse appears in particular to people who are receptive to her divine wisdom and uh, who can ask the right questions. And Hesiod's not a uh, field working scientist, uh, but he does ask the muse a very good question. He doesn't ask the muse, um, what will the olive crop be like next year? He doesn't ask the muse, uh, uh, will my sister end up marrying that jerk? He uh, asks the muse, what's going on in the deepest, broadest sense? How did this all happen? Where, where this refers to something like the world or, or reality. And I imagine the muse relishes such a deep question and relishes the opportunity to truly transmit divine scale wisdom. So you can see here, there's a strange thing going on with the voice. This is a, sort of a quote from Hesiod's text. And it begins, if we'd quote marks around the beginning, this would be Hesiod speaking. Tell me these things, Olympian muses, from the beginning. So tell me how it all began and tell which of them came first. And then it seems we've got this shift of voice where I bolded it, where now it's the, the muse speaking in response. When we talk about bicameral experience later in the course, we'll, we'll, we'll see this dyad is quite common in ancient, in ancient reports. And Julian Jaynes will say that, well, this is all Hesiod speaking. This is Hesiod uh, somewhat schizophrenically talking to himself. And he's shifting voices from his own and then to the muses, but uh, w whatever's going on, um, he has this experience of the muse appearing to him and he asks an excellent question. So not, not the first scientist, but, but as we've seen, science is not just a question of having the right answer, it's a, question, it's, it's a, it's a process of asking excellent questions and uh, Hesiod does ask an excellent question. And the answer is, we won't, we won't spend much time assessing the muse's particular answer here, but the muse does say it begins in chaos or, or disorder. And that may be a good answer. We'll, when we examine the design argument, we'll see that when, when you try to explain the order of the given universe, in terms of some supernatural orderer, a godlike creator, you run the risk of running into a, a kind of uh, a chain of cause and effect, what's called an infinite regress, where, where we, we then should ask, well, how did the creator get to be so organized? And we've really just displaced the problem we set out to explain, which is how, how the world got to be so, so orderly. And so if you say it begins in chaos, you, you maybe avoid that regress or displacement of what's called the problem of design or the problem of order. Of course, you then have, have your own problem, which is explaining how from chaos order could arise. And it may be that after Darwin, we have the at least outlines of a, of a very good explanation of that. Dar Darwin's answer is if you give chaos enough time and enough rolls of the dice through this process of, of natural selection, this sort of filtering, you get astounding, intricate order, which seems to the perceiver of it that it must have been consciously created. So Hesiod asks a great question and maybe the muse 
or Hesiod's split brain gives the outline of sort of prophetically what will be in the end the most plausible answer to explaining the whole the whole shebang well we're going to move forward through time from hesiod up to aristotle i think by the time we get to aristotle we'll see uh, a mind and practice which which is uh, quite familiar to to the modern conception of science in, in many respects hesiod is probably outside even the the canon of philosophy if you take a survey course in ancient philosophy and you know today you're getting kind of a survey lecture of, of the briefest kind of, of greek philosophy if you took a survey course in ancient philosophy you, you may not even include Hesiod, he may be mentioned briefly at the beginning, but we're, we're well into the canons of, of philosophy when we get to a figure like Parmenides, among the earliest of the great Greek philosophers. And probably, again, not, not a popular pick for, for first scientist, but one of the features of science we'll talk quite a bit about is its reductionist goal or tendency or dream or power and uh, this may be something that that explanation of a deep order seeks that that the ideal deep explanation would would uh, unify the div diversity of phenomena to a small set of principles or maybe a single principle and we find here at the be you know in the early years of the adventure of western rationalism let's say um, reductionism presented in its most dramatic form parmenides posits the one this is the most extreme form of reductionism where all of reality is explained not not merely in terms of a single principle or a single law of operation or a single type of atom you know if you could if you could show for example that all the diversity of physical phenomena reduced to to not just 118 kinds of atoms but one kind of atom it's all it's all hydrogen accumulated in in different permutations that that would be very impressive that would be um, you know a near complete reductionism but parmenides reduces all reality to a single thing parmenides astonishingly claims and argues so here's where um, the scientific or at least uh, rationalist rationalist element of his of his position is is very important and maybe distinguishes him from Hesiod's inspired reception. Parmenides will, will give argument for this astonishing claim that all of reality is a single thing, unchanging and indivisible. So time must be an illusion. Space, which, which involves the difference of here from there, must be an illusion too in space there are two things there's here and there's there and the the personal distinction between you and me must be an illusion so this this position is called monism or oneism monism i apologize for my shaky mouse writing monism the moan for one and the ism for the position and uh here at, Parme at parmenides and we'll see this running through a lot of greek philosophy and in fact running right up to the present day of scientific inquiry there's a very interesting input from the non from the religious from the non-rational or the religious and parmenides was a rationalist philosopher but 
He was also probably some kind of Apollonian priest and a practitioner of what was called incubation. Incubation was the divination practice of sequestering yourself in in a specially ritualistically marked room with a bed or a place to lay down. And you may prepare for, for your incubation with fasting and prayer. And then you go to your appointed chamber and you lay down and you receive the gods through, we would say, through you know, starvation um, inspired dreams. And Parmenides, in, in what's often identified as the first great text of Western philosophy, the very, the very beginning words of philosophy's written record, gives us a, an account of a, a dream, which for him would have been much more than just a dream. It was a record of a journey to another world where he encountered a wisdom goddess. And I don't think he names her as Sophia, but this is a statue of Sophia, who is the feminine wisdom goddess at the heart of Greek philosophy and right there in the word philosophy. Philosophia means the friendship of Sophia or love of Sophia. And he meets this Sophia-like figure. The goddess greeted me kindly and took my right hand in hers and spake to me these words. Greeted me kindly, letting me know, you're not dead, Parmenides. Don't worry, you're not dead but you are somewhere outside of life as you know it. So listen carefully. Don't let much experienced habit force you along this path, which path? To ply an aimless eye and resounding ear and tongue. But rather, the goddess advises, judge by logos. Sophia is at the heart of philosophia, and logos is the word, this master concept of, of rationalism. Logos is the word there. Uh, we see its traces in so many of our modern scholarly disciplines, all the ologies, the philologies and biologies and psychologies are disciplines of the logos. Logos here has the connotation, I think, of reason. So the goddess is saying, you can follow your eye and ear and tongue, the senses, or you can judge by reason. And she's saying, this is the preferable path. If you want the truth, young Parmenides, you'll judge by, by Logos. And when reason comes into conflict with what your senses are disclosing to you. Choose reason, the goddess advises. So Parmenides is an emissary of the human species. Uh, given this audience with a superhuman wisdom figure who is maybe taking interest in this uh, intelligent upstart monkey on the surface of planet Earth, and giving that monkey a little bit of direction, giving one of its emissary monkeys a bit of direction and warning that monkey that if you really want to see what's going on, uh, you're going to have to quiet the senses, um, place their conclusions in skeptical brackets and follow through with a kind of faith in reason. That is a confidence that reason will take you to reality even when the senses contradict it with this faith in reason you um you doggedly will find your way to truth zeno is parmenides student and uh, zeno is more famous outside of philosophy than parmenides but uh, Zeno's very famous paradoxes were in fact generated as arguments to show that his master's monism was, was correct. Zeno's paradoxes are meant to show us that our ordinary sense-based beliefs about reality 
must be wrong because they come into conflict with with the operations of reason. So uh, here's Aristotle's uh, a couple of centuries later summary of one of Zeno's famous paradoxes. What a what a wonderfully concise summary of this paradox Aristotle has given here. This is this is interesting. This is this is we're quoting Aristotle in one of his works, who's already doing a kind of history of philosophy. Aristotle's saying there's this guy Zeno who came before me and here's the argument in sum that Zeno gave and maybe Aristotle is stating it even better than Zeno did. I don't know but that which is in locomotion must arrive at the halfway stage before it arrives at the goal. <laughs> yeah um, okay uh, sounds like an obvious point to make. Aristotle uh, says Think about the implications of that, though. The implications of that are that motion is, in fact, impossible. That motion cannot happen. It can't even get started. So here's our leaping locomotor. I'm not sure. We don't have to imagine them leaping. We just have to imagine them trying to move from the origin point where they're stationary to our end point. And we'll call our endpoint one for the sum or the whole of the journey. And Aristotle points out that before Jimmy can get to before Jimmy can get to one, Jimmy has to get to half of one or 0.5. Okay. So let's make that our sub goal. Let's make this our sub goal and may as well call that one. Before we can get to this one, we need to get to the halfway point of that sub goal one, which is a quarter of the whole. Okay, and before we get to the quarter, we need to get to the one eighth, and so on ad infinitum. For any posited one, we need to first traverse the halfway point of that. And if you are imagining extension in space of any of any magnitude, you can always imagine the halfway point um, of that and forget about Planck lengths and modern conceptions of physics for now. I'm actually not sure how they would apply to this this abstract paradox, but um, you can imagine the halfway point of any extended line. And I guess Zeno's point is that it's impossible, therefore, to get to any one, because to get to any one, you need to complete an infinity of tasks. <laughs> and so motion, reason is telling us through this abstract exercise of the dichotomy, reason is telling us you can't move. Motion can't happen. Infinities can't happen in finite time, maybe is one way of putting it. Of course, our senses tell us that motion happens all the time. So this is just exactly what the goddess warned Parmenides about, that your senses will tell you one thing, reason will tell you a very different thing, and you must choose. So Zeno, following Parmenides, following the advice of the Sophia figure, chooses reason over the senses and uh, concludes that motion, space, and time, and all forms of division are uh, unreal, unreal, and in fact, deeply unreal. They are impossible. <clears throat> and therefore, there's the argument, there's the rational inference, therefore reality must be one. So Parmenides and his disciple Zeno, not, not doing laboratory science here, but they are coming to a view, a deep uh, reductionist view about the nature of reality through a broadly rational process. And remember, this game of first scientist is partly an exercise in figuring out what we mean by science. And uh, you can think of a slightly broader definition and you can think of a slightly narrow definition. And, and dipping back to the Greeks, um, I guess calling for a broadening of our usual laboratory white coat scientific method hypothesis um, um, testing conception of science and thinking about science as at its broadest a 
systematic attempt to uh, understand reality. And I guess we should have the word rational in there somewhere. It's guided by something we can call reason or it's guided by the logos. We can ask who is the first scientist. We could also ask who is the first uh, logosian logician. Briefly, another example of ancient Greek physical reductionism. All is water. I'm not sure what the Greek word there for water is, but um, all might be watery or water-like, especially when you observe what we call now H2O in its various dramatically different states. In the ancient world, they would have had opportunity to see water in its liquid form, water in its gaseous, diaphanous form in, in when it's boiled, and now and then, here and there, like Socrates on his campaign in Potidaea, they can see frost on the ground and even ice, and so water can be hard as rock, thin as air, and liquid like the ocean. That covers a wide swath of observable reality absent microscopes. And so this is this is not a terrible idea that there is a unity underlying the diversity of the physical world. And we can physically reduce that diversity to one of its elements, an element which shows a capacity to to you know, um, take on very different different forms. Anaximander is Carlo Rovelli's pick for the first scientist. And here is the world, the earth, as Anaximander theorized it. And we look at that and maybe laugh, uh, say this is some version of the flat earth hypothesis, but it's not flat, it's got depth. It's like a big fat uh, nickel or uh, sort of snare drum. And Ravelli points out that the exact shape of the Earth is is not that big a deal. So whether it's nickel shaped or a sphere or some slightly squished sphere is really not that important compared to the question of how that thing is situated um, relative to the reality around it. And Anaximander gives us this astonishing thesis that the Earth, whatever its shape, is floating in space. Earth is a solid that floats in space, and this explains the uh, traversion of the sun in the sky. I guess it should go westward, but uh, anyway. The sun uh, disappears under the earth and comes back up again, rising in the east. And then the question facing Anaximander, anyone who wants to posit the floating earth, is, is why the earth would not fall. Things that have weight seem to fall down. And um, Anaximander replies with the counter question of, well, why should it fall? Which is to ask the question, what do you mean by falling? What do you mean by up and down? And Anaximander's view was that all the experiences of falling that we have are of things falling toward the earth. Everything that drops falls toward the earth. And according to Anaximander, falling is just the movement of a body in space to a dominating body. This is, you know, uh, hints of theory of gravitation, that the dominant body uh, draws, magnet-like, the smaller bodies to it. And falling just is that movement. There's no absolute up or down. There's just the relativity of movement toward 
the dominating body, and Earth doesn't fall because it's not dominated by any uh, any body. There's no there's no larger body close enough to draw it into it. Or maybe Earth is equipoised between two uh, two dominating bodies, and their, their 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 gravitational power cancels out, so the Earth achieves an equilibrium and stays floating in space. <coughs> we we would now say, well, Earth is actually moving, or though maybe after Einstein we'd say, well, it's moving or it's not moving, depending on our frame of reference. So again, maybe even the question of whether Earth is stationary or moving is not not important or not as important after Einstein as the question of um, how it is that um, Earth is suspended. So according to Ravelli, this is a uh, Copernican scale revolution in our understanding. There are hints of Newtonian gravitation in it. And there are hints of um, a kind of relativism that is a, um, a an abandonment of absolute categories like up and down. If um, science is just as much a process of arriving at the right questions. And Socrates bears some mention in any survey of candidates for first scientist. Socrates' great superpower was the ability to swim in unknowingness. He had this stamina to uh, stay with a question and even unto eternity to, to swim in doubt and uncertainty. And... Um, in this state, which is for many of us a very uncomfortable, almost physically uncomfortable place to be, and we grasp for solid ground to overcome the dizziness or drowning or aporia of unknowing, um, in this persistence, Socrates arrives at excellent questions. Socrates did not write, and perhaps Socrates did not himself posit a lot of substantive theories. Plato, his, his most famous student, will put in his mouth, in his dialogues, a lot of substantive theories like the theory of forms, but perhaps the, the Socratic spirit is that which does not write, is not ready to write because it's still at this stage of deep inquiry. And there's a wonderful story which I would, I would guess is based in the historic truth here. We're, we're far beyond the misty myth of, of Hesiod. We're now into, into debatable uh, history and biography. And Socrates' great superpower was knowing that he didn't know. And this is Socratic wisdom, knowing that you don't know knowing that you're not good at Kung Fu from your two years of punching at yourself in the mirror is, uh, is the first step in becoming a Kung Fu master, right? The master will break you down and let you know um, quite painfully that you don't know anything yet. And th that is the, the necessary first stage in actually coming to, coming to know. It's a wonderful story of Socrates coming to explicit self-awareness of this superpower involves this great institution of ancient prophecy that here's here's the remains of the temple at Delphi people would travel from throughout the ancient world it had a had a period of activity of around a thousand years and it was quite active in Socrates's day and when Socrates was a young man, one of his friends was so impressed with Socrates' wisdom, with his, with his sort of spirit of inquiry, he journeyed this friend to the temple at Delphi and consulted the oracle. The oracle was the center of Delphic 
activity. I think she was situated in a cave somewhat set back from the main temple. And she was, by many reports, perched on this three-legged stool over a fissure in the foundations of the cave and um, would breathe in fumes from this fissure and answer your query. You had journeyed a long way, whether from Athens or Cairo, to ask her your question, should my empire go to war? Should my daughter marry that guy? Um, is Socrates of Athens the wisest man alive? This is the question Socrates' friend posed to the oracle. And the oracle, you can, you can Google, uh, I think there's a whole Wikipedia page on things the oracle said. We have some written reports of the fortune cookie slips she issued in her thousand years of activity. And she would often speak in sort of riddles or these occluded bits of wisdom that you had to decipher. Sometimes you decipher them tragically late. You thought she said, go to war, and then you go to war and your empire is in shambles and you realize, <laughs> oh, I get it. She meant don't go to war. I, I get the I get the twist on words, but um, she was very, very direct to Socrates, uh, to Socrates' friend. Yes, she said, Socrates of Athens is the wisest man alive. And the friend felt confirmed in his suspicions and boated and ran back to Athens and told Socrates the news. And it seems Socrates had enough respect for this ancient which to, to him even would have been an ancient uh, tradition of prophecy, that he, he took her output quite seriously and wrestled with it. For Socrates, this was a puzzle because internally Socrates felt very far from wise. Socrates was full of unknowing. And to his friends, he seemed to output wisdom, but really that wisdom was just the visible or audible activity of an internal, unsettled, questioning spirit. So Socrates wrestled and tested this claim that he was the wisest man alive and eventually got it. He got it that uh, the oracle was sort of dissing humanity. <laughs> Again, just as Parmenides visits the uh, Sophia figure and she she gives this upstart monkey a little a little tip to to get him and his people going. The oracle, uh, speaking on behalf of the gods, is saying to humanity through this message to Socrates that you people don't know very much. None of you really know much at all, but at least Socrates of Athens knows that. So Socrates is wisest among you for being at a promising starting point of some journey to genuine knowledge of reality. Socrates had many uh, friends who admired him to the point of worship, friends who were um, almost like disciples. And the most famous of Socrates' students or disciples was Plato. Here we see Raphael depicting Plato in his old old age, and he's walking through the uh, sort of central open open market of Athens, side by side with his most famous student Aristotle. And we'll talk about Aristotle in a moment, but. Here you can see Plato and Aristotle walking side by side. And Plato seems to be saying, up, get out of here. And Aristotle is saying, whoa, horsey, stay, stay a while and look around and see what you find. And I think, I think Raphael is choosing here um, to represent each man's characteristic attitude to reality in this frozen eternal gesture. Plato is very Parmenidean in, in emphasizing the distinction between the true reality and then what appears to us. And for Plato, as
as for Parmenides, the journey to truth is, is the dramatic journey of piercing through the appearances and using logos to perceive the real behind the illusion. For Aristotle, I, I think the emphasis is on getting to know the appearances. Um, and for that reason, Aristotle would be maybe a more appropriate patron figure of modern science than, than Plato. <clears throat> but uh, um, Plato, Plato's famous metaphor of the cave, this is Plato's picture of, re of, of the, our total situation. Reality is outside the cave. And here are a lucky pair who've escaped their imprisonment. This is us, unless, unless you're enlightened, you're a prisoner in Plato's cave, and you're observing what you take to be reality, but which is in fact a copy, this is a copy of a copy of the real thing. So the appearances are degraded copies of the real thing in the Platonic view. And here we have the puppeteers or the cinema projector casting the shadows on the wall. And when we ask, well, what, what are these shadows? What do they represent? In this metaphor, I think the answer would be physical reality, that what, what, what we perceive with our senses as being absolutely real is just a copy of something um, truly real, which Plato called the ideas, the capital I ideas are the uh, reality which the mind or the logos can have, <coughs> can have a connection with. But that connection is obscured by our sensory input. Aristotle saying, whoa, stay in this so-called cave and stare a while at these so-called shadows and let's see what we can discover about them. In Aristotle, we find almost miraculously coming from a single mind, this specialization of knowledge we associate with modern science. These are the names given to a number of Aristotle's works, just to kind of copy pasted these from the list of Aristotle's works in Wikipedia. And you can get a, a sense of the breadth of his curiosity this is almost, if you think of the lineage from Socrates to student Plato to student Aristotle, an amazing lineage, maybe unparalleled in intellectual history, or at least in European intellectual history. From Socrates, who did not write and maybe didn't posit much, to Aristotle, who graphomaniacally writes and posits theories. Uh, we see this very interesting development. From the Gillespie Dictionary of Scientific Biography, as you might imagine, Aristotle has a huge entry in that multi-volume biography. Um, and you know, when you study physics or chemistry or biology today, you don't start with Aristotle. If you're interested in intellectual history, you will certainly uh, spend some time on the Aristotelian foundations of the later sciences. But um, the biography is pointing out here that what has been retained through most of Western history are these Aristotelian categories, which we so take for granted now, but which, I mean, Aristotle wasn't the first to notice energy and give it a name, or the first to notice that there's this thing we may as well call matter, the first to quantify, but 
Aristotle through his corpus, which was passed on uh, in the ancient world and in, in, on through the medieval world and into the modern world, um, gave us a kind of organization of this terminology, which was retained their interconnections and the particular terms he chose were retained. So we see here in its in its in its deep logic, in its you know, logos also means word. It doesn't just mean reason. It's got many connotations. But in the very words that Aristotle has given us to frame our understanding of reality, uh, there's this unparalleled, uh, multi millennial influence. So Hesiod, not many people's pick for first scientist. By the time we've moved through, oh, uh, about seven hundred, uh, about four hundred years of Greek history, we've we've come to a figure who <clears throat> is speaking a language that is quite familiar to to modern science. Okay, let's come at this origins question from from a different angle, from a more critical political angle. Earth's land mammals by weight. And I think when you, when you see what is going on, you see the alternate title of this <clears throat> figure is humans have won. Here's humans, and most of the other squares, each of which represents a hundred million tons of biomass, most of the other squares are our cattle, our animal chattel, goats, pigs, cattle, pig, uh, horses, sheep, and the green, not super bright green, but I think you can make out the green Scatterlings of biomass here are the wild animals, or the wild, uh, the animals currently <clears throat> uh, not under direct human control. These are the animals at the margins of bound-in civilization and its um, agricultural sprawl. This happened over. 10,000 years. So 10,000 years ago, the ratio of free animal, uh, I think mammal, uh, biomass to human was estimated by, by one I think Canadian mathematician at 99 to 1. And there's been a kind of inversion in 10,000 years of civilization. 10,000 years is not a coincidental number. That's about the age of the city. That's a profound shift in the biosphere when this particular clever dexterous primate moved from a tribal scale of existence to a sedentary mass scale of existence in the city and so now we have one pound of free animal for 99 pounds of humans plus our um, animal slaves let's say This is the great political story of our age. This is the story of the Anthropocene, of, of one animal taking over the biosphere and, and completely transforming it uh, violently to be made in its image, that is to reflect its own interest. We pick a few favorite animals that serve our needs. We modify those animals through slow or rapid um, genetic engineering and eliminate as pests the remaining competing animals. So we bring in the uh, cattle to North America and eliminate the buffalo. We clear the sky and <clears throat> nesting grounds of passenger pigeons and bring in our uh, laying hens and uh, what they call broiler chickens. Here's the city 
of course, that's the familiar uh, um, city <clears throat> of dense population and built form. But the city is really the complex of the farm that supports it. And <clears throat> the densely populated region and it's it, this 10,000 year story is, 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 the, is the story of the rise of the city. And this is, again, a story of uh, one species remaking uh, the surface of the earth to reflect its own interests. So this is, this is the form you would um, Notice if you were doing an alien flyby every every 50,000 years of the Earth to see what's going on on this bustling, burgeoning planet, you'd put the brakes on if you came by 5,000 years ago or 1,000 years ago, uh, and you would have noticed just by sort of a visual glance that something had happened down here. And if you zoom in on these aluminum sheds, which dot the agricultural landscape, you'll probably find something like this inside. You'll find them packed, often layered with our caged animal slaves. These are food slaves, animals whose lives have been transformed into sort of meat machines. This is what Tuttle calls herding culture, herding culture at its um, precisely engineered. This is the herd finally under total control of its human master. And through good engineering, um, the proportion of human controller to animal slave reduces. You can have one person or a small family on a so-called family farm with a little bit of hired help, perhaps, controlling from birth to slaughterhouse. Um, hundreds or thousands of pigs, hundreds of thousands of chickens. Clearing the land of buffalo and then bringing in Here's a shot of the Chicago stockyards around 1900, I think. Clearing the land, these are buffalo skulls, clearing the land of the native fauna and filling it with our small set of favored fauna under our total control. Here's a typical chicken shed where their reproductive life has been completely uh, remade to serve our interests, the Asian jungle fowl, whom these, these laying hens are the descendant of, in its, in its you know, free state, had, like human mothers, one reproductive episode per month. I mean, they ovulated monthly, and through slow genetic engineering, we've um, turn them into egg-laying machines that sort of have a period once a day. We've linked their maternity maternity to our our breakfast schedule. So again, one one species completely engineering life and terraforming its <clears throat> planetary environment to serve its interests. This is I you know I I don't think. The, the takeaway from from this should be humans are especially evil where uh, I think Tuttle notices a, um, a species with a dual nature. And I don't think we're the only animal who in coming into this power would use it <laughs> to to extend its own interest. This is the way the way life tends to work. But here we are and we can uh, critically reflect on it ask how we got here and ask where it's going because it seems to have an apocalyptic trajectory uh, right now. Herding culture is culture which controls and commodifies animals 
And Tuttle argues that we are animals too, and we we too come under the control of this herding impulse, that the herder, maybe with some justice or some irony, himself becomes herded, that at the same it's not a coincidence that at the same time we are boxing pigs and chickens into crates. We are ourselves getting stacked into condo towers and tiny one-bedroom apartments and increasingly spending our waking hours under a fluorescent light at a little office carol. Uh, that herding culture is, is the regimentation of life on earth and that, that terraforming we saw the overhead shot of a moment ago is almost like it's been imposed top down from something a little bit alien to Earth's life, Earth life's own interest. But herding culture just, you know, it, it doesn't it doesn't mean literal cowboy culture, um, especially when we've refined the engineering of the herding. A very small percentage of the, of the population only need be in, in, in direct contact with the animals. And most of us can live in the bounds of the of the protected city without ever seeing a cow or pig or chicken or coming into contact one, with one or knowing someone who's made contact with one uh, outside of, <clears throat> you know, the Royal Winter Fair that comes once a year and, and, and shows us a slightly um, anachronistic glimpse into the old McDonald style farm. Control and commodification of animals. And apropos our course on relations between religion and science, Tuttle will point out that these, he calls them two proud sons of herding culture, have this reductionist tendency. Now, just to be clear, Tuttle is not anti-religion or anti-science, but he's, he's making the maybe unsurprising point that religion and science being very powerful institutions will will historically often be seen to um, serve the power structure they, they, uh, they benefit from. Reductionism we've, we've talked about as, as the uh, simplification of the complex to its parts, and this has a very macabre, very literal interpretation in Tuttle's usage. It's, it's the literal carving of the vital free animal into its consumable, commodifiable parts. So this free ungulate represented in the in the famous cave paintings in southern France from around I think 25,000 30,000 years ago is as it were unawares running headlong into a trap it's about to run into the herder And this reductionism will find manifest in both our religion and our science. One of the key terms of the scientific method, the angel of truth will tell Descartes in a prophetic dream to measure and number everything. And uh, to analyze is to break the thing into its component parts. Analysis is another word for reductionism without the sort of maybe almost political critique that's implied in a term like this. Take the word analysis back to its proto-Indo-European root, get to the root word lieu, which has this very physical sense of loosening, dividing, and cutting apart. So we see in, in one of our key scientific methods, powerful method for, for understanding the complex, um, very literal kind of reductionism. And it's 
not just a metaphor in the actual practice of science. Here we have the biolab. This is the scientific analog of the farm sheds we, we saw a moment ago. This is, must be a mouse lab. And this is a vision of vivisection. Vivisection is the cutting up of the living, the sectioning of life. And it's, it's a huge industry. It's, it's a um, major part of the, the life sciences. This is an estimate from around 2012. I'm sure it's gone up since then, especially as China and India expand their scientific technologic culture. 115 animals used, including killed, per year. All the animals used in the laboratory sciences are, are killed at the end of the process, often killed and then further taken apart for data or just killed and then disposed of because there's nothing else to do with them. With, with very few exceptions, I think there are, there are a few sanctuaries which try to make arrangements with laboratories to get some of the primates to a kind of retirement, but um, um, the mouse and the rabbits and the rats and the guinea pigs and the zebrafish and so on are all, are all killed. They're gassed or they're decapitated or their necks are broken by manual cervical dislocation, it's called in the literature, uh, or they're stabbed in the heart with a, with a poisonous needle. Local example, it's going on all around you. The, uh, the pig sheds, you have to travel a little bit outside the bounds of the city, uh, but a few blocks away, you, uh, find a major, major global center of animal research in the, the University Health Network or Hospital Row. Most of the hospitals in the downtown area are major research facilities too, and most of them have animal labs. Here's the research tower of Sick Kids Hospital at, at Bay, and Elm, Bay and Elm Street, just you know, two blocks west of us. And you can, you can, I mean, you don't have to dig very much. You can, through a couple of clicks, see what kind of research is going on there. Here's a mater maternal deprivation experiment. It's a common procedure of um, inflicting cardiac injury on neonatal mice. Here's uh, from Ronald Cohn. Last I checked was Sick Kids Chief Pediatrician. This is a bind and starve experiment on mice. Now these experiments on non-humans are all done for human benefit. Even, even in the veterinary sciences, uh, most of, of veterinary science historically has been for uh, agricultural control. Um, most of the, the great veterinary colleges in, in the world uh, are very closely linked to uh, herding culture, um, to the agribusiness today. This is the use of animals for human interest. We, we learn something about skeletal muscle mass of um, the mice. And because the mice are similar to us, they are our near neighbors in the tree of life, we can hopefully, that's the scientific hope, um, transfer what we've learned about them to the human case. Of course, there's a, it's a contradiction, ethical contradiction, I think, built into our use of animals in the laboratory, which is, um, This use of animals is scientifically uh, valid 
only if the animals are very much like us. And especially when you're doing experiments that involve psychological traits like the maternal deprivation experiment. Assumedly, if, if the uh, separation of mother and child after birth, in the case of rodents, is useful to understanding what goes on in human cases of, of maternal separation, that means that the psychology of the mother-child bond is very similar between rodents and humans. If not, then, then the experiment is unethical because, because it's scientifically useless for its purported aim. And if it's scientifically useful, then, then that's an, an acknowledgement that the rodent has a rich psychological life and suffers in ways very similar to our suffering. And um, therefore, we shouldn't be doing it to them. Anyway, that's, that's one way you could begin to build a case against the scientific use of animals. Studies on fear and pain. Uh, I guess, uh, you know, fear and pain are a expected byproduct of, of herding animals into a laboratory environment and manipulating them and injecting them and probing them and then eventually executing them. But um, there are experiments also which as part of their design or aim, involve inflicting fear and pain on the animals. Here's a picture of herding cultures engineering competence to process hundreds of millions anim of animals a year to process 3,000 or 5,000 cows in a single processing plant per day, to process half a million chickens a day in a modern um, chicken slaughterhouse. You need excellent engineering. You need to very carefully um, uh, map out step by step, cut by cut, the process and and turn the slaughterhouse into a very tightly functioning disassembly plant. So again, T Tuttle is not anti-science. He's pointing out that our scientific genius has often served this great political um, order of, of human domination. And again, this is a very familiar point from, from history. We can look at 20th century geopolitics and notice how American and Soviet science were, were, um, were often bent towards serving national interest and weapons programs and so on. Anything powerful like science and religion will often be co-opted by, by the great, the great powers. And, and, um, so again, not, not surprising. Talk a bit about religion now and just think for a moment about the centrality of animal sacrifice to religion historically, especially in the <clears throat> Middle Eastern uh, religions, which are the focus of Tuttle's discussion. So here we have representations of ancient Jewish animal sacrifice. This is an artist's representation of the temp temple at Jerusalem with the sacrificial fire in which the bits of the sacrificial animal were fed and sent up to Yahweh. The dissipating molecules of the burnt animal flesh are sent up to Yahweh as an offering. And the temple no longer stands. It was destroyed by the Romans in uh, the first century AD. But uh, the temple, when it was active, was a very a bustling center of animal sacrifice. And animal sacrifice was the, the central ritual of temple life. If, if you were on a kind of Hajj as a diaspora Jew to Jerusalem in Passover week, your main ritualistic business at the temple was to purchase an animal and convert your currency at the boundaries of the temple and then, and then have it sacrificed by the officiating priests. This is maybe a more surprising example. This is Hindu animal sacrifice in Nepal. 
And we have to ask, what's with animal sacrifice and religion? What, what does this mean and why is it so central to religious life? And the answer, you know, the correct answer will surely be complex. There will be many reasons um, for sacrifice's centrality, but, but Tuttle points out that humans have this dual nature. We, I mean, we, we've dominated life through gross violence, but we have this incredible capacity for compassion too. And part of the ideological business of hurting culture is to suppress that in us from a very young age, to train us to, to otherize animals and to see them as for us. But we have this natural compassion, which is extraordinary. It can, it can extend, extend across family and racial and even species boundaries to take in all sentient life. And the sacrifice, according to Tuttle, is one of the techniques we've developed to, to negotiate this contradiction between our natural compassion and, and our violent use of the animal. That is, there's, there's a part of most of us, hopefully, which feels bad about what we're doing to animals, what we're doing to our very close relatives in this vast, lonely universe. And, and the ritual is our way of allaying our moral doubts about what we're doing. When we sacrifice the animal before God, we're telling ourselves that God approves of this action. So we're convincing ourselves through this ceremony that what we're doing on a larger scale in the slaughterhouses is, is okay. In fact, it's, it's demanded of God. There's, it's not just God says, okay, you can do it. God demands that you do it. And in the Jewish scriptures, God is quoted as, as saying, he, he, I love the smell of burning flesh. I love the smell of your burnt offerings. Keep, keep them coming. Keep them coming. But also in the biblical record, you find Yahweh himself of conflicted mind. In, in Isaiah, Yahweh has this almost schizophrenic turn of mind and starts yelling at the people and says, who told you? Who told you to do this? Who told you I wanted my courts of the temple trampled with the hooves of animals and running with the blood of oxen and lambs? And uh, so if we think of Yahweh as, at least in part, a projection of Jewish psychology. Uh, Yahweh, like, like the people, is conflicted about this, this use of the animal. So science, this is a, a bit simplistic, but let's say, according to Tuttle, science under herding culture engineers the herding. And religion provides the ideological narrative, the framing of that politics to um, facilitate it. And here we see in the Quran a hierarchy declared by Allah, this sort of chain of being from God to the angels, to man, and then to the grazing livestock. The livestock, and notice the very term livestock implies they are for you. The term livestock is a reductionist term where the free animal has now become commercial stock, like a toaster oven on a shelf. It's all for you. There's here a, a complete ignorance of, uh, maybe a willful ignorance of the vast independent history that we now know these animals have had. They have their own four billion year old story, which is, which if we go back far enough, converges with our own. For most of their history, they lived relatively independent of us, but here, Religion is providing this kind of amnesiac narrative, which asks us to ignore all life or all history outside of the city, outside of the 
herding, the herding of the animals, which is about seven or 8,000 years old, is the beginning of history, according to herding culture. And so we forget um, any competing organization of life. Vast, kind of maybe disturbing picture of history. This is Saul taking prisoners and cattle. A very typical picture of Earth of the last 10,000 years. A human herder master at the very you know, close to the top of the biosphere's hierarchy on a herded animal. <laughs> right, the man on the horse is a perfect symbol of human domination, both in the domination of the horse and then what the man's going to do with it, which is ride into war and then bring back. Why? Why is he going to war? Well, we can be a little bit reductionist ourselves and say he's going to collect cattle, human and non-human cattle. And we find in the biblical record as, as partly historic uh, accounting of the of the catch of these raiding runs, 250,000 sheep. These are I've got to assume these are exaggerated numbers, uh, but uh, even if it's exaggerated by an order of ten, you get you get the you get the picture. 